So in part, the outcome of any wound does depend on the type of suture material and the architecture of the needle. Using the wrong needle or suture type can result in excess tissue damage at the wound interface and result in a less than ideal cosmetic outcome for your wound. My name is Dr. Jordan Kai Simmons and I'm a head and neck surgery resident out of Los Angeles, California. And today I wanna to teach you guys all about suture material and needle types. So let's get right into it. The ideal suture material causes minimal tissue injury, minimal tissue reaction, is easy to handle, has a high tensile strength, a favorable absorption profile, and resistance to infection. The most important suture characteristics to consider are the absorption profile, whether it's non-absorbable or absorbable, and when it is absorbable. You also want to consider the strength of the suture, that is the tensile strength, or just the raw strength of the material itself, and at what level and what stress levels it can break. You wanna consider the knot strength or how much strength or tensile strength that a knot or suture loses once you tie that knot and apply an excess amount of force or stress on the suture material itself, as well as the breaking strength. What forces and vectors will cause the suture material to break once placed in the wound. Consider the coefficient of friction or how much friction or drag is applied to a wound once you're dragging the suture material through it. In general, monofilaments have lower friction, polyfilaments have a higher coefficient of friction. You also want to consider the elasticity, plasticity, and memory of a suture. Elasticity is very important because anytime you close a wound, the wound tends to swell, and you want your suture material to be able to swell and then recontract with the wound itself. You want the suture to be able to have a high level of plasticity or be able to be very malleable so that when you tie a knot, it stays. And you also want to consider the level of memory of a suture. If you deform the suture by tying a knot, does it just try to revert back to its linear form or the form that it took when it was in the suture package? When categorizing suture material, we wanna break them down into three general categories. We wanna think about the absorption profile. We wanna think about the fiber itself or the source of the fiber, whether it's natural or synthetic. And then we wanna think about the filament type. So we'll go into absorption profile first. In general, there are absorbable and non-absorbable sutures. Absorbable sutures can tend to be more reactive to tissues and pro-inflammatory, which can actually be good for wound healing if placed within deeper tissues. Absorbable sutures should be used in deeper tissues when doing a multi-layered wound closure, and they can also be used on the surface of the skin when removing sutures is impractical. The classic and probably the most common absorbable suture is the vicryl suture. The vicryl suture is coated with hydro phobic copolymers, which prolongs the life of the suture. 65 to 70% of the tensile strength is actually maintained after 14 days, and it is completely absorbed after 60 to 70 days. Vicryl sutures are great for approximating deep tissues such as fascia and muscle. Other examples of absorbable sutures include monocryl sutures and PDS sutures. Monocryl sutures maintain their tensile strength for one week, but after that undergo rapid degradation by about three weeks. They're great for delicate subcuticular closures due to their high pliability. PDS sutures are similar to monocryl sutures in terms of their pliability, but they have a much longer duration of tensile strength, which can be maintained for up to six weeks compared to one week of the monocryl suture. PDS sutures are great for areas with high wound closure tension, such as the abdominal wall when doing a hernia repair or even doing a tummy tuck. Then we have non-absorbable sutures. Non-absorbable sutures are great for cutaneous closures when you want to be able to precisely control the timing of removal of tension from the wound closure. Or when it's impractical to place an absorbable suture, such as in tissues that are highly damaged, such as previous radiation, or generally weak and unreliable. Sometimes, however, non-absorbable sutures are used within the body as permanent sutures. The nylon suture, for example, when used as a permanent suture, maintains 65% of its tensile strength after 10 years. Polyester fibered sutures such as Ethabond or Mersaline with indefinite permanence are really ideal for implanted devices or procedures requiring the sculpting of cartilage such as otoplasties or rhinoplasties. When considering suture materials, we have two basic categories. That's the natural suture material or the synthetic suture material. Natural suture material tends to cause more tissue inflammation, especially collagen-based fibers such as chromic or plain gut. During tissue inflammation, natural 
suture material is absorbed by neutrophil-mediated proteolysis, which allows for it to dissolve quickly within the wound bed. Examples of natural suture material include plain or chromic gut, cat gut, or fast absorbable suture material. Plain gut suture maintains its tensile strength for 7 to 10 days and it's completely absorbed within 70 days. Fast gut suture maintains its tensile strength for 5 days and is completely absorbed within 60 days. Chromic gut suture is on the higher end of tensile strength longevity for the natural sutures in that it maintains its tensile strength for 10 to 14 days and then is completely absorbed within 90 days. To differentiate between between the natural gut material, you'll want to use plain or chromic gut sutures internally, such as in the oral mucosa or in a body cavity, and then you'll want to use the fast gut sutures externally, such as on the surface of the skin. Of note, cat gut is not from a cat. It's actually derived from bovine intestine, so cat actually stands for cattle. Natural suture materials are most often absorbable. However, there are a few examples of non-absorbable natural suture material, such as silk and cotton. Silk is the most common natural non-absorbable suture, and it is classified as a non-absorbable, but technically it does absorb within two years. You'll often see the primary surgeon in the operating room leaving silk ties in place as they tie off blood vessels to ensure that there's a permanent closure of that blood vessel. On the opposite end, we have synthetic sutures. Synthetic sutures tend to have a little bit more elasticity compared to natural sutures, which are often a little bit more rigid. The advantage of the elastic nature of synthetic sutures is that when the wound expands and there is tissue edema, the suture itself will actually expand with the wound, and the elastic property of these sutures will allow the suture material to then contract with the wound as the tissue edema resolves. Examples of synthetic suture material include PDS, monocryl, and nylon sutures. So when should we use a synthetic suture versus a non-synthetic suture? So we really need to consider the absorption profile and the tensile strength first. Natural sutures are usually absorbed much more quickly, whereas synthetic sutures tend to have a higher tensile strength and are more reliable for wound approximation. Finally, let's talk about the filament type. We have either monofilament or polyfilament. Monofilament sutures tend to have a lower coefficient of friction, meaning it's a little bit more slippery, versus polyfilament sutures have a higher coefficient of friction, meaning that it's a little bit more rough as it drags along the tissue. Monofilament sutures usually have a greater memory, so precise handling is necessary when not tying. Of all monofilament sutures, particularly synthetic monofilament sutures, proline is probably the best for holding knots. Examples of monofilament sutures include monocryl, PDS, nylon, and proline. Polyfilament sutures, again, tend to have a higher coefficient of friction, but this can be reduced by adding coating materials to the suture, such as organic waxes or silicone. And polyfilament sutures are usually more pliable. They have a little bit more give to the suture and are much better at handling and holding knots. Examples of polyfilament sutures are vicryl, silk, as well as cat gut. Generally, you'll want to use a monofilament suture at the skin level and a polyfilament suture deeper inside the body cavity. This isn't always true and it's a little bit more nuanced when to use one versus the other. Suture size is also a huge consideration when determining the best method of wound closure. Suture size is usually designated in the terms of the USP or the US Pharmacopoeia, but any given suture label will also display the metric size or the European Pharmacopoeia size designation. Suture sizing is just like the sizing for IVs and injection needles. When the number is followed by a dash zero, the larger the number, the smaller the suture. The smallest sutures designated 10O and 11O are often much finer than human hairs, and they're usually used in microvascular surgical repair when you're suturing vessels, or for ophthalmologic procedures when you're suturing on the eye itself. The largest sutures, double zero, one, or two, and notice these suture numbers are not followed by that dash zero, are as large as fishing lines and are often used for procedures that involve closure of the abdominal wall or the chest cavity after open heart or lung surgery. Now let's talk about the business end of the suture material the needle and needle handling. The needle has three basic components, the tip, the body, and the swage. The tip is the portion of the needle that enters the body first. The body is where you actually hold the needle with your needle drivers, and the swage is actually attached to the suture material itself. Now, it's very important to know where to grab the needle. You want to grab the needle about two-thirds the distance from the tip at the body of the needle. The body of the needle is actually flat compared to the tip and the swage, and will allow you to hold the needle in the most stable position. If you hold the needle at the swage, you risk being able to rotate freely around the round axis of the needle. And if you hold the needle at the tip, you risk dulling the tip 
and causing more tissue trauma when you're placing your suture. The needle holder jaw should ideally be less than 30 to 50% the width of the needle. If the needle holder jaw is too narrow, you risk being able to rotate the needle around the free axis of the needle holder, which would be unstable when you're attempting wound closure. As you can see here with this big needle here and these small castor viejos, it easily rotates around uh, the axis of the needle, even though the body is much more flat relative to the swage. Using these regular needle holders with this tiny needle, let's say I were to grab the needle with the uh, distal end of the needle tip, if I close it, it just flattens out that needle right there. This is going to prevent you from getting an adequate curve in the needle when placing your sutures and ultimately will result in a worse closure. There's also several types of needle tips. The most common and the most important for you guys to know are the taper needle tip, the reverse cutting, and the conventional cutting. There's also spatula needles, taper cut needles, or blunt needles which you can use when cannulating the skin when you're placing filler, and several other different needle types, but we're going to talk about these three most common here. So the taper needles are a rounded needle with a sharper point that's directly proportional to the rapidity of the taper. We call this the taper ratio. The taper ratio is usually between 8 and 1 to 12 and 1. Higher ratios mean sharper needles. The way that taper needles work are that they spread the tissue around it as it passes through the tissue. These needles should be used in soft elastic tissues such as muscle or subcutaneous fat. They're also good for use with blood vessels during microsurgery as well as nerves and fascia. Cutting needles most commonly come as conventional cutting or reverse cutting. These needles work by dividing or cutting the tissue as it passes through. Cutting needles generally have three sharp edges at the tip. Conventional cutting needles have the third cutting surface on the inner curve of the point. Conventional cutting needles should be used with care because upward traction when driving the needle through the tissue can cause a shallower than intended bite. And you can actually cut through the tissue accidentally or you can even avulse the tissue with too much tension placed by your suture knot. In contrast with reverse cutting needles, the third cutting surface is on the outer curve of the point. Reverse cutting needles should also be used with care because you can end up taking a deeper bite than intended when excessive downward pressure is applied while driving the needle through the skin. Either conventional cutting or reverse cutting is ideal when trying to cut through tough tissue such as skin. Skin tolerates cutting wounds much more easily than pressure wounds. And pressure wounds from sutures can result from the use of tapered needles because they spread the tissue around it as you push through as opposed to cut through the tissue. They can also be used in ligaments, the oral cavity, and the nasal cavity. Finally, the needle shape itself can have a huge impact on the cosmesis as well as the efficiency of your wound closure. The name of the needle shape or the suture code generally reveals its function. BV sutures are good for suturing blood vessels. P or PS sutures are for plastic surgery. PC stands for precision cosmetic. RB for renal artery bypass. And even more specifically, TF sutures are actually used in repair of tetralogy of Fallot. Sometimes the needle shape name can be more practical, uh, like CT sutures or CT needles are stand for circle taper. SH needles stand for small half circle. So this is literally everything you guys need to know and more about suture material. Make sure you guys are watching the other videos in this series about not tying suture technique and then the general overview of all things suture related so that you can become a suture master. You'll be able to use this video series to teach others great suture technique and overall improve your skills. And finally, make sure you guys are subscribed to this channel if you want to see more educational, high quality content like this, as well as lifestyle content, day in the life of a surgeon in Los Angeles. Also, if you guys want to see the daily activities that I go through, my morning routine, all my different habits, make sure you follow me on Instagram so you can get a glimpse into my personal day in the life in real time. Thank you guys so much for joining. It's been so fun doing this for you. I'll see you in the next one.